Uh, we need to be the party of nationalism, and I'm a Christian and I say it proudly, we should be Christian nationalists. We are polarized between two political tribes, perhaps like never before. These are not my preferred pronouns, these are my pronouns. You will use them. Now is the time to do what you're told. <laughs> but do these opposing camps have more in common than they care to admit? What they believe in is a uniformity of thought, of religion, of of state control and state power. And is there a political philosophy that sees the world through a completely different lens? If you have a state, a managerial state that's either a progressive state or a conservative state, and it's manipulating people, herding them into a certain place to behave in a certain way, that's not real. To help us answer these questions, I was joined by Bruce Party, a professor of law and executive director of Rights Probe, a law and liberty think tank. He is a classically liberal legal academic who believes in equal treatment under the law, negative rights, private property, limited government, and the separation of powers, which are foundational to the Western legal tradition. He is a critic of legal progressivism, social justice, and the discretionary managerial state, and has written extensively on a range of pressing legal subjects that are at the forefront of the culture war inside the law. The truckers were very clear before they arrived. They are free people. They are not about to agree to not be free. Bruce has taught at law schools in Canada, the United States, and New Zealand. A prolific writer and figure in the public arena, he has worked with leading liberty-oriented think tanks in Canada. We began our discussion by highlighting the differences and similarities in prevailing ideologies and how political philosophies can be judged by as much by what they do when they're in power as what they say when they're not in power. And the progressives, for their part, of course, uh, when, when, when they were known as liberals, say, for example, in the 60s, mm -hmm. championing things like free speech. Yes. And, and, they, were, and, they, and they really were. They really were. And, and, but it turns out, it looks like they were doing so because they were not the ones in power and they were being censored. And, and okay, fair enough. But then now that they are in power... It turns out not to have been a genuine commitment to the idea of free speech. It was more like they wanted their values to be the one to be expressed. And vice versa for the for the conservatives. I mean, when 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 they were ascendant, it seemed to be quite reasonable from their point of view to 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 impose restrictions on heresy and obscenity and pornography and, and yeah. so on. But now they've become the free speech people. Right. Or claim to be. Uh, but there are reasons to, to wonder about that in the same way that you wonder about the progressive's commitment to the idea. And, the, and for my money, the only group with a genuine commitment to the idea are the classical liberals. Because they are the ones that are not in the business of promoting and insisting upon a particular set of values. And that's what distinguishes them from the other two. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so... We have this idea today that we have a populace that is polarized politically. Yes. Left and right, conservative, progressive. Yeah. Um, but but really, I, I mean, this, this is a, it necessarily an oversimplification. But let's just oversimplify for clarity. There are really three. There are progressives, there are conservatives, and there are classical liberals or libertarians, if if you like. I mean, those two are together basically in the same camp. There are differences between them, but for right now, let's not worry about those. So you have this, what people sometimes imagine as a spectrum, left and right. I don't like that model, and there's, there are different models to use. Political scientists have described the political spectrum in various different ways. The way I like it is, is what they call the, the horseshoe. Or I like, to, I like to do it this way. Imagine that you've got the political spectrum on a string, uh, left, and, left and right. You take the string with your hand and you pull it up so that the ends of the string come down in a, in a circle, mm -hmm. almost touching at the bottom. And this is the, the horseshoe idea. And then you draw an imaginary line through the middle of the horseshoe. 
Okay, so now your left and right are now near the near the bottom of the circle or horseshoe, and they're close together because they belong close together because they, their their fundamental sort of systemic or structural ideas are similar, in the sense that they both believe in the group, they believe in governing for group dynamics, group values, they want to supervise people so that they adhere to a certain set of ideas and values. Mm -hmm. Those values are not the same at all. I mean, they, they fight about that, but the idea of the group they have in common. Above this imaginary line are the individualists. So collectivists down here with the groups. Above the line are the individualists, and that's where the classical liberals live. At the top of the horseshoe, yeah. you like. And so now it looks like they're at the center, and in, in a way they are, but they're distinguished from the other two groups because of their fundamental um, focus on the individual as opposed to the group. Yeah. Okay. And the funny thing is that through the eyes of each one of these three groups, there are only two groups. Yes. Right? Yes. So the conservatives think, well, there's conservatives and there's liberals. And yeah, there might be a variety of liberals. There might be classical liberals. There might be progressives, other things. But they're all liberals. And liberals are the source of the problem. The progressives, for their part, think that there are only them and the far right. Yeah. And the far right is the conservatives, the libertarians, the classical liberals, anyone that doesn't believe in critical theory and critical race theory and social justice are, are far right extremists and are wrong. And the classical liberals, through their eyes, the world consists of individualists and collectivists. And the progressives and the conservatives are both collectivists. They believe in community. They believe in collective values. They believe in solidarity. They believe in doing things together. The people mm -hmm. should more or less have a common theme, a, a common heritage, a common tradition, and should be pushing in the same direction. The conservatives and the progressives both like order. Now, different orders to be sure, but they still like order. Whereas the classical liberals are totally fine with chaos. Really? As long as it's peaceful chaos. Hmm. So the priority for classical liberals is peace, no violence. If, he's, if you're not violent, like you're not using force against each other, whatever, whatever you want is fine. It's your life. You do what you want. Yeah. Whereas for the progressives and the conservatives, they're interested in, in an, uh, an ordered value system that conforms with their convictions about what is right and wrong. So we have these three groups. And is it just a value system or is it a political system? It's a political system. The only the only real value that the classical liberals promote is 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 it is, is the value of individual choice, individual liberty. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the choices that one might make are the individuals to make. So they're very hands-off. And the other two groups, the progressives and the conservatives, are 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 value driven. And in that sense, they are much more concerned with content and result as opposed to process. The classical liberals are the process people. And the and the so for example, uh, the classical liberals think about things. I think this way a little bit like a little bit like I might describe how a classical lawyer might think. Mm -hmm. So classical liberals think uh, principle, and then apply the principle to the real world. Yeah. You know, rules applied to facts. Okay, so here's a principle: free speech. If you believe in free speech. That means if you're applying it in the real world, then people who are saying things you don't like, well, they're allowed to say them because that's the principle. The progressives and the conservatives at certain various times have endorsed the idea of free speech. Mm -hmm. But it turns out they don't really care about that process of applying principles to, to, to real life. They care about the content of the result. So if it so happens that someone is now saying stuff that is morally repugnant, well, then we can't have free speech now. I mean, not, not now, because it's more important to have the content right than it is to have the process right. 
So here's a question. I don't think I'm old enough to remember any time when the conservatives were ascendant, really, culturally, let's say. Right. Um, so I don't recall that period where they were not champions of free speech. Right. Right. Well, so I'm I'm a little older than you, but I, it's only it's not really dominant in my memory either. But I can recall, for example, times when there was a dispute about whether, uh, for example, um, material that was being imported from elsewhere that was sort of gay pornographic material mm -hmm. should be allowed into the country. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that question is a conservative question. Okay, here's a person who's ordered material. It's 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 pornographic and it's gay. There was an era in which the cons the ascendant conservative ideal would have been, well, we don't we don't want that in our country. Mm -hmm. The classical liberal response would be, it's none of your business. Well, what are you talking about? And that would have been the progressive attitude at the time as well. Yeah, yeah. I see, I see. So the classical liberal sometimes gets thrown into both camps, depending on what's depending more upon, prevalent in the culture. Well, sure, exactly. As I said, from the conservative point of view, except maybe right now, but, but so we, we have this pairing of the conservatives and the classical liberals. We, we, you know, in American, fairly recent American political history, we have this fusionism idea. Um, perhaps the best example is the uh, the Reagan period, where conservatives and classical liber liberals or libertarian-minded people basically were together in the in a common camp so as to promote a certain set of ideas that, that worked pretty well to get Reagan elected and and, and so on. Hmm. Today, those two camps are also working together to some extent because they have a common enemy. The progressives, because the progressives are ascendant. The progressives control everything right now. And so the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So the classic liberals and the conservatives have, have common uh, aspirations and goals in pushing back against what has become a very authoritarian mentality on the part of our state apparatus. For different reasons. For different reasons. For different reasons, but but there's also a lot in common. So okay. in many respects, the conservatives have, have taken on and claimed the mantle of being liberty people. Mm -hmm. and, and great, to the extent that they mean it, great. Uh, but if you scratch beneath that surface a little bit and test it, sometimes it doesn't quite hold up to to inspection because it turns out that if and when they succeed in getting the power back, uh, they may wish to, again, promote a certain set of values, again, using the power of the state yes. to do so. Yes. Okay. Now, those would not be progressive values. I mean, they're genuine in rejecting the set of values that the progressives are, are promoting. No, no question about that. But, but nevertheless, that agenda is different than the classical liberal agenda, which is to take off the whole thing and let people do what they want. And, and so the degree of tension between the conservatives and the classical liberals, you know, will become most apparent and most acute if and when, uh, you know, their, 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 their uh, cooperative campaign succeeds mm -hmm. in, in pushing down the, uh, the, the progressive tide. So that makes sense, though. It's kind of like monkey in the middle. <laughs> It's the, like the, a sport in a sense. You always have, so if there are these three groups or these three camps, yes. then there's always going to be two that are working together. You know, I'm throwing the ball to you and the guy in the middle is trying to catch the ball. In a sense, yes. And unfortunately for the classical liberals, I think for the most part in, in, in the recent past, they've always been the monkey in the middle. I mean, they're, they're always mm -hmm. paired with the, with the side that's losing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that makes sense because, well, the classical liberalism has turned out to be a difficult ideal to sell to the population. I think because it's based upon an abstract idea mm -hmm. as opposed to a concrete set of, of, of results, outcomes, values that people can identify with. I mean, so it'd be easy, much easier for someone to decide if they believe in 
the traditional nuclear family or not, if they believe in this kind of speech or not, if they believe in uh, transgenderism or not. I mean, those are, those are binary choices as opposed to separating out. And this is a very difficult thing to do, to separate out your personal philosophical inclinations about things versus how you think the law should work and what the state should do. You need people who understand that those two things are different questions. You can have a particular set of moral values and, and, and persuasions about how you'd like things to work, and yet still believe that people should be able to make their own choices about things, even if those choices turn out to be not the ones you'd like them to, to make. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the classical liberals are able to take those two ideas, separate the spheres, and tolerate the chaos that occurs when people are able to make their own choices, even ones that the individual classical liberals would consider to be maybe not such a great, a good choice. So a good example would be, uh, let's say, the opioid crisis. Yes. So perfect. how would yeah. how would a progressive deal with this? How would a conservative deal with this? How would a classical liberal deal with this? Great, okay, great. So the 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 stereotypical. I'm going to use stereotypical because mm -hmm. it it sort of um, defines these three groups. The stereotypical conservative response to the opioid crisis and other recreational drugs is to outlaw the drugs. Mm -hmm. This is bad for you. It's an immoral kind of activity. It does you no good. You get into trouble. It creates addiction. It creates healthcare costs. It's just not a good idea. We're going to outlaw it. You're not allowed to do this. This is the this is their use of the state to promote a result. The progressives, for their part, uh, seem to think that the state should be there to uh, almost to promote or at least enable. provide, enable, yeah. enable people to get the drugs that they that they want and to provide health care when they get addicted, to provide for this and that and the next thing. It's a it's a it's sort of a it's it's a state safety net on steroids. All right. Yeah. And the classical liberals basically say, look, this is your life. If you want to do something, you go ahead and do it. It's got nothing to do with me. I might, I might think that this is a bad choice for you to make. It's not my choice. Mm -hmm. It's not my life. None of my business. You go ahead and do what you want. But, but remember, you're responsible for your own choice. So if you decide to do this, okay, but don't come to me afterwards and expect me to fix it. It's a really hands-off. Yes. It, 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 it's your deal. So by definition, do classical liberals believe in personal responsibility? Well, yes. Or is that but, an add-on? It, well, it's, it's yes, but not in the same way that the conservatives do. Okay. Okay? So the personal responsibility for the classical liberals goes like this. There are two things that always have to travel together. In order for it to make sense, those two things are control and responsibility. Okay? So let's imagine this. Imagine that, imagine that um, in a family, uh, dad loans the car to uh, his daughter. And the daughter bangs it up in the parking lot of the mall. And, and the father uh, grounds the son, his son, for the damage to the car. And the son says, why are you grounding me? Mm -hmm. uh, Susie was the one driving the car. And, and, and the dad says, well, you didn't have control, but you have responsibility. <laughs> that, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You, you, can't, you can't govern yourself accordingly if you don't have control, and therefore you can't have responsibility. It's a basic legal proposition. Yeah. So the classical liberal says those two things have to travel together. To the extent that you have control over your life, you are responsible for how, for how your life turns out. You have to have responsibility. Otherwise, let's put it the other way around. If we're not going to give you responsibility for your life, then I'm sorry, we can't give you control. If the state's going to be responsible for housing you and feeding you and fixing your medical problems, well, then you're not allowed to eat junk food because that's too expensive for us. So instead of taking away your right to make your own dietary decisions, for example, we are going to give you responsibility for their consequences. Those two things are yours. And 
that's the one that makes sense to me. But the, but the progressives and the conservatives interpret this differently. The progressives are very much a parental state. Yes. Right. So when the you, nanny state. The nanny state. When 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 you make bad decisions to get yourself into trouble, well, we are there to look after you, and therefore, in a lot of uh, respects, there's no real incentive to make sure that you make the right choices. And you can see the results of that. We can see one result in real time that I'm thinking of is Sam Bankman Freed. Sure. Right. Who has sure. now had, you know, he's a progressive and he has all of those values, his parents as well. And his parents are, are lawyers and professors of law and things yeah. like this. Right. Yes. And they've come in to save him and basically say, like, it's not his responsibility, really. And he says that he thinks that way, like, oh, I just made mistakes. And it's very childlike. Well, we, we will see if that works. And this I mean, he's at least been charged. Yes. Right. And so we'll see where that legal process mm -hmm. goes. Mm -hmm. It may turn out to be that way or it might turn out in his case, to have been a mirage, that in fact he does have responsibility. I, I don't know how how it's going to go. Yet. Yeah, of course, nobody does. But yeah. but it will be it will be interesting to see. But just thinking of that actually being applied by the the progressive mentality, it's that kind yes, of idea. Yes, yes, quite. And quite right. actually, his mother uh, wrote in yes. the paper that she doesn't yes, believe she in free will, right. which is also interesting. Right. Um, does a classical liberal believe in free will? I know I'm sidelining you from where you were going, but you can come back to it. <laughs> well, well, uh, yes. I think the answer, short answer is yes. Uh, let's put it this way. The classical liberal philosophy is based on the presumption that free will does exist. If it doesn't, here's the, here's the, here's the trick. If free will does not exist, then it doesn't exist for anyone. The, the sleight of hand that the other camps sometimes pull is this. They say, well, you know, free will is questionable. A lot of people are making, appear to be making choices, but actually they're not exercising their free will. And they need to be guided. They need to be told how to behave, what to do, and so on. But, but there's a problem there because that assumes that the people who want to make the decisions, who want to set the agenda and want to do the supervising, that they have free will. They have expertise, and they have authority. Mm -hmm. So now you've split your belief about free will into two bits. Those people over there don't have free will, but but we do. We know what we're doing. We're going to tell you what to do. Well, come on. Is it either going to be one thing or the other? All right. And in a way, this gets to the 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 one of the fundamental uh, ideas upon which classical liberalism is, classical liberalism is based. Right. So you have. You have, here, here's a favorite thing amongst the progressive and the conservatives. And not just, not just them, but it seems to be a human inclination to look for universals. You know, universal moral values. Mm -hmm. uh, universal truths, objective truths. You know, what, what, what can we say about the human condition? That is a slide into collectivist thinking. Here's where the classical liberal begins. The only mind inside your head is yours. There is nobody else that knows what goes on in there. And so the only one who's in a position to know what's in your best interest and what you ought to do and what choices you should make, the only person who's in that position is you. The only one. And no matter what all the other people think about the universals that they think they see, whether it's in human psychology or human history or, or, or moral values or whatever it is, they are projecting their own beliefs now upon you. Mm -hmm. And that must be rejected. As long as you are not interfering with somebody else's ability to do the same thing, then people should leave you alone. The, the, the classical liberal mantra is, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> yes, and I won't tell you what to do either. Exactly, that's the deal. Right. So what would you say to people who think that that doesn't actually work in practice? You know, um, let's, let's think of some examples um, of maybe how a person on the left would deal with something where they think, well, we need to kind of have the state come and help you. And maybe a conservative might say, well, 
we might need either the state to come help you in another way or maybe something else, um, but you don't know what's best for you. And so society will just go into chaos in the worst kind of way right. if we allow everybody to just decide what's best for themselves. Right. So so uh, Jonathan Haidt's done some interesting work on 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 the... I guess I guess I might call it the the psychological temperament of of the various camps. Right, and that's in the righteous the mind. The righteous mind. Okay. Yes, and and the pattern that 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 he found, he was he was measuring amongst other things uh, what I might call a, the the degree of squeamishness on the part of these political philosophies. And interestingly, especially when we're talking about fusionism, this combination of the conservatives and the classical liberals, or the, or the libertarians, the, the, the conservatives, um, according to him, were the highest on the scale of, peop of, of people who felt squeamish about things. The highest degree of feeling of squeamishness, as in, don't, don't want to see that. Yeah. And the libertarians were the lowest. As in, you know, I don't like it, but I don't really care. Mm -hmm. And so one of the implications you could take from that is that the conservative philosophy is a reflection of that, that emotional inclination, as, what, as is the libertarians. Like, tolerance, fine if you're a libertarian, but if you're a conservative, determined not to let that happen. So, for example, let's take um, prostitution. Yes. Okay. So another good example of the difference between the three camps, but let's deal with the conservatives and libertarians first. Mm -hmm. um, a, a conservative might well say, look, the idea of selling yourself for sex is, is repugnant and we can't have it. We just cannot have it. It's, it's a terrible thing. I, won't, I don't want to live in a society where that happens. So we're going to make it illegal. Mm -hmm. Libertarian or a classical liberal might say, well, you know, I, I might not think it's a very good idea. I mean, I wish people wouldn't do that. But it's really up to them. I mean, it's their life, it's their body. Uh, if it's happening, like, not on my property, then, you know, you go off and do what you want. And it's, it's a tolerance of the chaos. The classical liberals have a tolerance for chaos as long as it's peaceful chaos. Whereas the conservative is inclined to want order. Mm -hmm. And an order that is consistent with a set of values that's clean, that's not 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 obscene, it's not revolting, it's not offensive. And the progressive, let's just fill in that gap. Yeah. The progressive, um, with regard to prostitution, I think we could say that their inclination would be to allow it, even to promote it, and to regulate it. To bring in the, the the managerial state and say, right, here's a thing that we that we should be dealing with. Yes. Here are the here's here's our, what the rules are going to be, everybody. You know, to to keep people safe. Yes. Right. Yes. 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 So maybe it's a good idea to talk a little bit about why these things actually don't work in practice. Like if you don't come from that classical liberal perspective, you right. know, uh, or or vantage point of saying. You do what you want, regardless of what I think about it. I might find it repugnant also. Right. Or I might think that it's okay. Right. Um, or I might think that in some cases it's okay. But either way, you know what? You do what you want and I'm not going to get involved. Like there's also, I think, an argument to be made there that that's uh, the better way. Um, because what the conservatives try to do and what the progressives try to do, using that exact scenario, don't tend to to work really well in real life, right? Like if you, for example, conservative, let's say let's ban prostitution. Right. Well, what's going to happen? Right. Right. You're going to have it happen anyway. Right. There's going to be a black market. You're going to have all these unintended consequences. You're going to have um, all kinds of things that, you know, crime maybe and people getting hurt rather than if, if, if it wasn't illegal, let's say, because people sure. are going to do it anyways. Right. And I think that that's maybe part of... Um, the belief system of a classical liberal is understanding the human condition and that there is that spectrum and that people are going to do things anyways, well, right? Yes, that's true. And so so this is one of this is one of the justifications for classical liberalism. But here's here's the irony. So what you've just described, if I can put it this way, mm -hmm. is a consequentialist justification okay. for classical liberalism. 
Okay, yeah. And, and and the other camps have this too, a consequentialist justification for conservatism or, or progressivism. And they make the same case based upon different information and data and reasoning. But the case is for the conservatives, for example, you know, society works best when we do it this way. Mm -hmm. When we do it our way, people will have the appropriate values, they'll they'll you know respect their societies and cultures and they'll believe in god and they will act appropriately they will recognize the 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 the, the community codes that are placed upon them and so on um the progressives do the same thing they 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 don't do it very well because they're very good at ignoring data and insisting that data is different than it actually is mm -hmm. but nevertheless there there are attempts to justify things based upon information. Um, I mean, I happen to agree with you that the, that the case, the consequentialist case is best for the classical liberals, but, but a lot of it is based upon reasoning rather than real world data because we haven't really had a, a pure classical liberal state yeah. situation maybe ever, I mean, maybe a little bits here and there yes. but i mean we really we never really had a, don't really have a any pure, evidence or a test case mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right um so we have to watch out for that as well but 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 the but the consequentialist arguments on the part of all of these three is a, is you have to watch out for it though because that's not really the core of the idea anyway so let's put it this way let's say let's say that the consequentialist argument for classical liberalism doesn't hold up. Let's say that maybe, at least through the eyes of some people, what you get at the end of the day with classical liberalism is not as good as what you get with conservatism, for example. I mean, some conservatives would say that. Mm -hmm. Some conservatives would say it's more important that we all hold these values as, as important than it is for us to achieve whatever we achieve under the classical liberal banner. Okay? All right? Fine. But the consequences of these ideas is not what counts. So the conservatives will sometimes ask the classical liberals, sure, freedom, fine, but what's, what is freedom for? And what they mean is, what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. I and mean, what, what are you trying to achieve? And what they mean is, you're, you're supposed to be trying to achieve a life of virtue. And freedom only works to the extent that that's what you do. So if you take this freedom and you exercise it irresponsibly, well, then the whole idea is undermined and you shouldn't have the freedom. You need the discipline to be able to exercise your freedom in a certain way. And if you don't do it, then the whole enterprise is lost. Hmm. Okay? And the classical liberal response to that is, you don't get it. Freedom's not for anything. Freedom is. Freedom is the point. If people are free, then whatever you get is what you get because people are human and they're doing it themselves. That's the value. If you have a state, a managerial state that's either a progressive state or a conservative state and it's manipulating people, herding them into a certain place to behave in a certain way, yeah. that's not real. That's not people deciding their own fates in a free way. That's a good point. So it doesn't matter what the consequences are of any of these things. To a right. classical liberal, it doesn't matter. So freedom is actually uh, the means and the end? The means, the, the freedom, is, freedom is the end. Yes, freedom is, freedom is the goal and the means in the sense that what we'll end up with depends upon how all the individuals decide to be free. And that is the point of it all. That's the point of it all. I mean, anything else, anything else, let, let's put this in different terms. Anything else is an exercise of power. The progressive ideology and the conservative ideology to the extent that it's enforced through the state is an ideology of, of force. Because after all, that's what laws are. They are rules imposed with the force of the state. Mm -hmm. And so wherever, whenever you have the state coming in and saying, Here's what you can or cannot do. That is necessarily an exercise of power. So of the three camps, it is only the classical liberals or libertarians 
who are the peaceful ones, if I can put it that way. They are, they are the camp of peace, as in, we're not going to make you do anything except not be violent towards other people. Mm-hmm. And other than that, your life is your own. The other two are all about the use of the monopolistic force of the state to, to achieve the values that they think are, are right. Yes. Right. Um, so how does a classical liberal view the law or what would be the ideal application of the law? Right, right. So as opposed to this managerial or administrative state that we have now, which is grown and become ubiquitous. Uh, it regulates everything. It, it manages, it supervises, it subsidizes, it taxes. It, it, it has its fingers in everything. Now, you can't, you can't run a business without cooperating with the managerial state, without collecting its taxes for it and remunerating the, 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 the state for the taxes that, not remunerating is not the, is not the right word, the, 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 the collecting and paying on behalf of the state what the state wants. Mm -hmm. The classical liberal version of the state is sometimes called the, the, the night watchman state, meaning a minimalist state that exists. It exists, it has borders, it has police, it has courts, but it is there for keeping the peace. Mm -hmm. And as long as there's peace, there is no coercion, there's no violence, you know, you can, you can enforce your contracts. Uh, you, 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 you can't uh, go around uh, hitting people or causing them physical damage. But otherwise, the state is out of it. It's minimalist, it's small, it's, 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 it's not driving the bus. The people are driving the bus, and that's what the culture becomes. The culture is the sum total of the decisions that all these people make every day of their lives in the same way that a market works, right? Yes. There's, a, there's a parallel between the way society is supposed to work and the way a market works. And sometimes, one of my criticisms of the conservative philosophy, as it is sometimes expressed, is that they say, well, I'm, I'm you'll, you'll hear this sometimes, I'm, I'm, um, I believe in economic liberty, but I'm socially conservative. Meaning, I believe in free markets, but I believe in the state uh, promoting and enforcing certain values. Okay, well, baloney. Because those two things are not separate spheres. Mm -hmm. It's all part of the same thing. You either have liberty or you don't. Yes. And that means you have free markets. You're allowed to transact with other people as you wish. And it means you can promote your own values in the, in the course of those transactions. So the, the, the attempt to sort of carve out an area where we're not going to be free is a betrayal of the idea of being free. You just can't, for my money, you, you can't, it can't, can't be done. Yes. Right? Um, it's not consistent. It's not consistent. It's not internally consistent. You either have the idea or you don't. Yeah. So do you think that the founding of America was based upon mostly classical liberal values? Oh, that's a very good question. I suspect that it was a mixture of what we might today call classically liberal and conservative values. See, this has been, I think, um, a, a, a tension in the, in the history of Western countries, and in particular North America, um, sort of a, 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 an uneasy balance between classical liberalism and conservatism. Hmm. And neither one being transcend or not ascendant, I guess is the best word. Neither one being completely ascendant. There are a lot of conservative ideas that run through the history of the United States, for sure, including in, in, the, in the package that the, the founders created. But there are important classical liberal ideas in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not until much more recently that the progressives show up Right. right, and and then and then take over, right. um, and, and the conservative cri criticism, and I think historically they're probably right, is that the progressives um, break up, break away from the liberals, the classical. I mean, so let's just talk about the word for a minute, liberals. Right, yeah. liberals now means something different than what the word's supposed to mean, right? Because yes. liberal has the same root as liberty; it means freedom, 
the, the, the group that wants less interference are the liberals. That's not what it means now. It means the opposite. I mean, the liberals now are illiberal. They are authoritarian. Those are what I mean by the progressives. I just don't like to use the word liberals because they've taken the word. I want yeah. it back. Yeah. But that's why we add classical to the liberal label now so as to mean the, the actual original liberals. So you have this, you have this tension between uh, liberal ideas and conservative ideas and, and you know, Democrats and, and Republicans. And that's not ex an exact match either. And there's always, you know, specific politics involved as, all the way along. But, but, you, but you have their, in, in, that, in that founding and in that mix through time, um, a, a, a working out of what that balance is supposed to be. But I don't think you have that working out anymore. I mean, you have you have now the the progressive uh, victory. If I can put it that way. Yeah. Uh, you have the the ascendance of the administrative state itself, which is a reflection of that progressive ascendance, because nothing reflects the progressive ideal better than the 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 the, the permanence and the than the ubiquitousness of this state apparatus. And it's such now that even if you campaign on some other kind of platform and you manage to get elected, I mean, the chances of you actually putting that program that is different from the way the state operates, I mean, how, how are you gonna do it? Yeah, that's a really, really tough question. Um, you know, I was looking at the article earlier today about brokenness. Yes. I'm actually going to pull this up right now um, because people are talking about this now, which is the idea that all of the institutions are so broken mm -hmm. that they're unfixable right. and that you would need to just start some new institutions and kind of redo things, which I don't even know if this is possible. Right. But I'm going to read you a quote from here. Okay. Um, that kind of points it out as well. And, and also how people feel disenfranchised because of this, right? Because of this administrative state, mm -hmm. um, also because of the directions that both the progressives and the conservatives are going in, they don't really feel like they have a political or even a cultural home. Right. So somebody writes in this piece, which is called Brokenism by mm -hmm. Alana Newhouse. Mm -hmm. This man says, I don't know what I identify as these days because everything has gotten so scrambled. I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I don't even think I could define myself narrowly as either a liberal or a conservative anymore. Mm -hmm. The one thing I know that I fundamentally do believe is the premise of your piece, that the dominant institutions of American life in education, in the arts, in politics are either totally broken mm -hmm. or so weak or corrupt that they're becoming irrelevant. In a way, the only thing I know that I believe in is brokenness. Right, right. Yeah, so there's a there's a an irony in that statement. I mean, I think the premise is correct. I mean, I'm inclined to to think that things are that broken myself. But the irony is that they're broken in the sense that the institutions are compromised, corrupted, but they're not weak. I mean, if anything, they're stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. And they're and they're and they're dictating the terms upon which we all will perform. Yes. And I don't think that's fixable in any sort of certainly short-term political sense. And so uh, you count me amongst those people who think the thing is broken. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not, but as I say, it's not, it's not broken because the thing is falling apart. It's broken because it's not falling apart and because it's become so powerful and so ubiquitous that uh, that it insists upon its way. So if you if you are a, a politician or if you are a, a public figure of some kind, an academic, and you speak as we as we are speaking now, as I'm speaking now, and say, you know, what has to go is the administrative state. I mean, today that's crazy talk. Like, what are you talking about? How are we supposed to function without? The Department of Motor Vehicles and the and the and the, and, the, and the public health people and and this and and that and I mean of course the list goes on forever. But how are we supposed to do that without all of these people who know what to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, just think of the idea of policy. The idea of policy. This is what governments do now. They make policy, and policy 
is a set of rules for people to follow. And we have policies about everything. And so many people today graduate from universities from various kinds of programs. And the only thing really that they're equipped to do is make and carry out policy. So the universities are kind of feeding this administrative state. Of course. Right. Of course, of course. It's it's their Shangri-La. I mean, the idea that we should now have a state whose function it is to, to supervise the behavior of all of us hopeless people. I mean, and, 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 and they are staffed by people, many of whom, and, and, and this is a, in the case of the universities as well, of course, but staffed by people, many of whom genuinely think that people cannot be trusted to make their own decisions about things. They're just not well enough equipped. They're not, I don't know, they're not, they're not moral enough. They're not educated, I don't know, and not educated enough, not aware enough, uh, to, to racist, uh, to, to, to sexist. There are, there, there are lots of people in, 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 I think, I would say, in both the progressive and conservative, not, not, not all of them, I'm not, I'm not painting them all with the same brush, right. but there's many people in those camps who genuinely believe that it is too problematic, too dangerous to allow people to live their own lives themselves and make their own choices. It cannot be allowed to happen. Yeah. So they, they don't believe in that idea that, which is so simple, as you said before, you have your own mind, it's yours. I can never know what's in there. Right. So how can I ever make better decisions for you or worse decisions, right? Sure. But, but even to be free to choose right. <laughs> what those decisions are, sure. right. right? And so that's what this, um, uh, and this actually, it also comes back to um, the vision that, that, that you shared before about the line then being pulled up into a circle, right? Yes. Where these are kind of, it's groupthink. It's collectivist think. Well, everything below the line, that imaginary line. We so said we we had the we had the string in the circle, or the horseshoe, if you like, and we had the line across it. Everything below the line is a collectivist idea. Right, and so if you're part of the group, so if you truly kind of see the world through the collectivist lens, yes. right? Yes. Then how can you believe in the one mind? Well, you well, so you don't, except that you do, and the one mind you believe in is the one that. Um, well, in a sense, depending upon who you are and what your place is in this hierarchy, the, the mind you believe in is yours. Mm -hmm. so you believe that you have the expertise to decide what it is that everybody else should think. And so it's, it is, it's essentially elitist. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it believes in expertise. It believes in the idea that people, only people who, who, who have the job and the and the background and the education and the training and the thinking to be able to sort out how we're supposed to behave, only they are able to give us these directions. And if you don't have that expertise, then you really have no business deciding for yourself. You have this this world, you know, that's that's being run by technocrats, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's supposed to be very egalitarian as well, and everything is wonderful. Um, but then the question becomes, like, who gets to decide who the deciders are? Right, 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 exactly. Exactly so. And that, so the more power the deciders have, the more contentious that decision is. How so? Like, can you explain that right. a little so bit if more? You have, if you have a night watchman state, and it doesn't really do very much except keep the peace, Maybe a few other things, but it's it's very limited. Then does it matter who your politicians are? I mean, they're not making your decisions anyway. They're relatively powerless because the basic principles have been established, and the reach of the state is 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 is, is held back. So so who cares who has who has office? That's a good point. But. If the state is powerful, well, then it makes a big difference right, who wins. Right. And that's why politics is so contentious and so important. Yes, and, and has become uh, so tribal. So tribal. 
and so influential in every sphere. So, so today, just to give you one example, the, the, the stock market seems to be more affected by pronouncements from the White House and from the Federal Reserve and from this department than it is uh, on the basis of, you know, company reports. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, you, you become political watchers instead of commerce watchers right. to know what's going to happen out there in the market. Right. Okay? That's a sign that your, your government has too much control, even short-term immediate control, over your economic activity. Another great example would be the midterm, ele- uh, midterm yep. elections, which were very disappointing for people, mainly conservatives yep. or people who were voting right. Um, and that, that was kind of an observation that I had as well, which is that things are so weighty in the, in the politi- political sphere that um, you're really depending on your, your camp to win in order to feel like your life can actually go better. Sure, sure. That, that's a reflection of, of how much they control. Yeah. So, uh, Bruce, how do we get to a place of more liberty? Like, so you said earlier, this classical liberal principles applied fully have never actually really happened. I mean, they've they've been applied in part. In part, you can you can see them here and there. I mean, the the idea of the idea of of relatively free markets is a classical liberal idea, mm-hmm. e- even when they're not purely free. I'm not sure you ever had a, like an actual, absolutely free market, but right. you know, you've had things that, that come close at times. Um, we, we've had, we have traditions in our legal system that are classical liberal ideas. The, the idea of blind justice, the idea of equal treatment under the law. Mm-hmm. Those are all classical liberal ideas, or at least I would call them that. And, um, and so it's, it's not like it hasn't been around. It's been around. It's been very influential. Been very important to the prosperity of the West. We have certain sort of core ideas that have allowed the West to prosper the way it has. Going back to your consequentialist proposition, mm-hmm. but it hasn't been pure in the right. sense that it has been the thing that has ruled and nothing else has come into play. That's probably not not been the case. How do you achieve it from here? So. I think an awful lot of people who are against the progressive agenda want to try and rescue our institutions and go back to what they believe existed before, at some point before. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's either possible or practical or a good idea. It's not the right way to think about it. I would try to go forward from here to a place that reflects these ideas if we can. And the first stage along the way is a very, very difficult one, a very difficult one, which is to get a critical mass of people to reject the idea of the managerial state. It's gonna be very difficult because they're used to it. They they think that's what government is for. Yes. Um, the, the, one of the central propositions upon which the state rests now is that that the that the that the, that the state and the officials who run it have the power to decide what is in the common good. Mm-hmm. That idea has to go. As long as we are arguing about what is it, what it is that's in the common good. That's a mistake, because the, the 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 sentence is that they have the power to decide what's in the common good. They have the power to decide is the key point, not what's in the common good. Yes, they have the power to decide. They cannot have the power to decide what's in the common good. So it's not the content. It's not that- the content. It is the power proposition. And until people or a critical mass of people question and reject that idea. All you're going to get is rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. And this is what we've seen, I guess, historically. You have this, you know, progressive ideology, or let's say a left wing at the bottom of your horseshoe. Yes, yes. Right. You have communism there. Yes. You have fascism here. Yes. 
They're very close. They're almost very mirrors similar. of each other in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways. Now they're not exactly the same. We don't want we don't want to make the make the case that they are the same. There, there are differences in the definition and how they occur and what they mean, but they do have this in common. They are both essentially and overwhelmingly collectivist ideologies. Yes. Right? Yes. And and, and so in that respect they do resemble each other, yes. Um Matt Kibbe who uh, he has his own podcast, Kibbe on Liberty. Mm -hmm. He did a series on this and it was called The Deadly Isms. Right. And so, so he goes through all of the different ones, authoritarianism, socialism, communism, fascism, etc. Right. And that's pretty much what he comes to the conclusion of as well, is that these are all under the umbrella of collectivism. Yes, correct. And so that's right. maybe, maybe it's important to look at the details in certain circumstances and to understand them, but more important maybe is to understand the difference between collectivism. Yes. Well, let's make this distinction perhaps would be helpful. So, sure. so w one of these uh, authoritarian um, variations is dictatorship. Yes. Okay. And dictatorship is typically a situation where you have a, some kind of strong man, you know, perhaps with the control of the military, who has taken over power and is imposing his or her will upon the people against their will, okay? Now, that's a bad situation, but it is not as dangerous as totalitarianism or communism because in those two situations, usually at least at the beginning, you have the people agreeing and, and on the same page and pushing for yes. the regime that's coming into play. Yes, it's the collective It's the collective drives. mentality, that's correct. right. And so the and 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 the mere imposition of force that you have in a dictatorship, I mean, as bad as it is, is is not as bad as as the as the embracing of the collectivist idea that you get in a totalitarian situation. Are some people then just more prone to think like collectivists, or is it something that? Uh, the pendulum sways where sometimes things really move towards collectivism and then something very bad happens over the years and then people realize, well, you know what, that wasn't such a good idea. And so we move again towards liberty, towards classical liberal values, towards individual rights and individualism, if you want to call it that. Um, how does it all, all play out, really? Well, we should be so lucky for it to be a pendulum. Mm -hmm. uh, the professor... I forget his name, but a professor at Northwestern University, I believe, wrote a piece called The Suicide of the Liberals. And at and near the end of it, he he makes this point. He says, Well, how do we know it's a pendulum? Yeah, pendulum's just a metaphor. How do we know it's a pendulum and not a snowball? Maybe it's just a ball gathering size and speed at the top of the hill, and it, as it rolls down, it gets bigger and and it only collapses at the very bottom of the hill. What, what I, I believe he said, what encounters no resistance does not stop. The pendulum metaphor assumes that we're in a bad state, but it's going to get better, don't worry, just hold on. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe it's a snowball. Right. I tend to hope that it's a pendulum, and I tend to think so too. And... And that's because of historical cycles, the 90-year oh, yes. lifespan yes, cycle, yes, right? right? Right, sure, yeah. And so kind of the idea is that you go through the same things every lifespan. This is like the fourth turning, is it? Right. Yes, so, same, same idea. Same yeah, idea, yeah, I didn't like the conclusions of that book, which right. were, of course, like administrative state solutions, basically. Right, right, <laughs> right, right, yes, of course, yes. Um, but, but there were some good nuggets in there, uh -huh. uh, and, and it does... Uh, I think it's worth reading and and looking at it through that lens as well, mm -hmm. um, thinking that maybe this is what happens, right? Is that you have a whole lifespan, you have these lessons that are learned, you have stories that are passed down, and by the time the the last uh, petal falls off the rose, mm -hmm. a la beauty and the beast, mm -hmm. and you no longer can remember what happened before, maybe that's when things go bad again. Right. Well, we're really painting in very broad strokes here, but that's fine. That's good. Let's just let's just. Imagine for a minute. So it, you're right. Nothing lasts forever. So it will always be a pendulum in some sense. Mm -hmm. The things will eventually 
erode and change. Snowballs melt. Snowballs melt or they <laughs> reach the bottom of the hill and collapse. Right. Uh, but at the same time, everything has a timeline. And Soviet Union had a long timeline. I mean, not, not yes. that long in, in, in civilizational terms, but, you know, better part of a century. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible that what we are seeing is the is is such a transformation of the West that 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 it will, with the benefit of hindsight, will be seen to be the end of the West or, or the beginning of the end of the West. Mm -hmm. And what will come after that? Who knows? Maybe it will be a nightmarish kind of technocratic aristocracy, a surveillance state in 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 serious terms that that bears no resemblance to. You know what people think of when they think of the free and liberal Western democracies. Who knows? Who knows? But 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 we're in a difficult period. So here's an idea then. So some people will argue that this is what classical liberalism actually leads to. Correct. They will. Yes. Correct. Yes. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes. So so the conservative argument especially goes like this. Classical liberalism, well, let me put it a different way. I, I've heard it said this way. The classical liberal diagnosis of the situation that we're in would, put in simple terms, would be not enough freedom. The conservative critique of where we've gotten to, the cause that they would attribute is too much freedom. Mm -hmm. The cause of the of the place we're in has been too much freedom, because people have been able to make all kinds of bad choices in their life. This is not just libertarianism; it's libertinism. Mm -hmm. um, people are all screwed up. They're making, doing crazy things. They're they've lost their anchor. They've lost their anchor in God. They've lost their anchor in traditional values. They don't know where they belong. Uh, society is coming apart, and in order for society to hold together, you have to have a common set of virtues and ideals so that we can carry on. And that's what we're missing, and that's your fault, liberals. That's what they would say. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't think that's true? Obviously. I don't think it's true. Yeah. I don't think it's true. I don't think it's true. Um, but even if it is sort of true. I don't care. Why not? Because the world they're describing is not a free one. I would rather be free and take my chances than to be any, under somebody's thumb. I certainly don't want to be under a progressive thumb. But I don't want to be under a conservative thumb either. I do not want anybody telling me what to do. And I don't think anybody else should either. But clearly, like, we're not free now. So how could classical liberalism coming back to that that critique of it how could it have led to here right like how could it have led to a place where there's this massive administrative state um you know where people are not actually free where government interrupts right. our life like that i don't think that it makes sense well but logically. so, so, here, so here, here here's a here's a possible dynamic and i'm not i don't think it's the whole story by any means yeah uh but but there's a piece of it and, and some of it you can and I don't, I'm not sure how genuinely to take it, but there are echoes of it still today. So part of the progressive case is that it is protecting people from conservative oppression. Mm -hmm. So if you wind back the clock, and consider, for example, you know, during a certain period, how gay people were treated. Yeah. And the explanation being, well, you know, we have to take steps to protect against that, to correct against that, to compensate for that. All of what we're doing, this is the, how the story would be told, all of what we're doing is a reaction against all the bad things that you did to us, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, 
if I can reverse the polarity on what you said earlier, that the conservatives would blame the classical liberals for this, and they would. This is the way the classical liberals should blame the conservatives for all of this. Because the progressive thing that has happened, in a sense, is a reaction to the oppression of the conservatives, to insisting upon their values, their virtues, their way, we'll do it our way or no way. Right? If they hadn't done that, if they'd been classical liberals when they were ascendant, the progressives would have less to push back against and to echo now. If we only had a classical liberal world, there wouldn't be any of this because yes. there wouldn't have been any telling of one group by the other group about what it is you're going to do. And then I think as well in a classical liberal world, you could choose your cultural values. You could, you would eventually, if you were more of a collectivist, you could move towards a certain group that shared your values, you know, but like, wouldn't that eventually well, lead to a rise well, of, we, you know, like a collectivist group who wanted to kind of come and pound, pound the classical liberals? Possibly. Quite possibly, but so the, the one of the, one of the knocks against classical liberalism is that that they're against groups. You know, they're against cooperation, they're against community, they're against family, they're against church. And none of that is true. Mm -hmm. None of that is true at all. The point of the classical liberals is listen, human gathering groups. So they're, they're, they should gather in groups. It's great. As long as they do it voluntarily. Right. You pick your own group. And then if you have common values, then live by those values. There's nothing in classical liberalism that says don't do that. They're against forced compliance with a code. And so if you had classical liberalism, what you'd have hopefully is an evolution of a culture because of all the decisions people are making about who they want to associate with and what the values are and, and, and so on. It's possible that what you say would occur, that there would be a dominant group eventually that come along and say, right, we're, 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 the, we're the largest group, we're gonna do it our way. Sure, I mean, maybe, but then you have the same kind of struggle and it's always a struggle. I mean, Ronald Reagan said that, you always have to be defending freedom or you lose it. So here's actually a consequentialist argument for it then, even though that might not be your favorite kind, right? Yep. Um, <laughs> is that if we compare this again, and I'm thinking about something you said to me off camera earlier, yes. um, about free markets. Yes, right? yes, yes. So this is basically kind of the same thing. Like we've seen, we actually do have the data that shows that when we have freer markets, you have more economic prosperity, you have more choice, you have more flourishing, True. you have higher uh, standards of living it, it, it for happen, everybody. It happens to work. It happens to right. work. Yes. Right. So maybe the same thing could be applied culturally, and maybe we would see something like that too. You, you, you would like to think that human society would evolve best when it is free, in the same way that markets evolve best when they are free. That, that's the parallel. And the argument, the conservative argument, that markets should be free, but society should be supervised, doesn't make any sense to me at all. And the progressive argument is that none of it should be free. Well, the progressive, <laughs> see, but the progressive argument has been um, that, well, the progressive argument has, has become an anti Western argument. Right. I mean, they, they, they are an anti Western philosophy now. That might not, not have been their origin, although in some respects maybe it was, mm -hmm. but, it, but whatever it was, it has become an anti Western stance, which is ironic because they now control the place. But it's sort of a, it's sort of a, a, a nihilistic, self-defeating, hate myself kind of, of yes. proposition. They control the institutions and yet they think the institutions are evil. Yes. Which is probably why they're compromised and corrupt. Any last thoughts, Bruce? Anything about, um, you know, if you think it's possible that we move towards a free society or, or anything else you'd like to say about classical liberalism uh, in general? It's going to be a difficult road and answers are not easy. I mean, if it was a simple plan to put together to move us into a world that was consistent with classical liberal ideas, I mean, I think it would be on its way already. It's a matter of persuading people in numbers that things are not right. And the way to put them right is not to create another department of 
government to fix it because they that's that's the problem not the solution um but it's going to be a challenge because because people have grown up living under a nanny state and as i alluded to earlier that's what they think the job is so you really have to change the framework of the way people think and that is no easy task so there's a there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work.